this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about emotional strength, emotional resilience, emotional health, whatever you want to call that. Really couldn't have picked a, a better topic in some ways because this is a really emotionally trying time. Now, uh, some of you guys are visitors here, and if you are, welcome. Glad you're here. Many of you know me to some extent, and you know that I'm not notoriously very emotional. Did any of you know that? I had a feeling once, but it turned out to be hunger, and I ate a chocolate bar, and it passed. Uh... I got teary-eyed one time at a meeting, and Kevin Clays tried to grab a picture because he had never seen me emotional before. I remember that. I think it was one of the times I excommunicated the Clays family. I'm not notoriously very emotional. So what am I doing talking to you guys about emotional strength and resilience? Well, there's two ways I feel that I have some, uh, some stool to stand on, as it were, when I'm talking about something. Either it's something that God's really worked out with me that in a way that like, I, I'm a natural at, that I get and I engage with in, a, in an amazing way, and I can share out of my overflow. The other way is something I struggle with, and I can share with you out of my struggles and some of the things that I have learned. See, sometimes when you're a natural at something, you're particularly bad at sharing insight about it. And so this morning, I want to fully come to you in all honesty and share out of my weakness. If you're okay with that, if you're willing to walk with me on this journey, I'd love to share with you out of my own weaknesses um, and some of the lessons I've learned the hard way. And maybe uh, throughout this morning, we can look at a way of strengthening our whole self as we go through chaos and confusion in a way that leaves us well connected to who we truly are, who we truly want to be, and who God is. Does that sound good this morning? Are you willing to walk with me? We're going to go through this. You see, there's a secret you don't necessarily know about me. Those who know me very well probably do. Uh, But the facade that I'm not very emotional that I'm highly rational, kind of logical thinking person, is a facade. Not exactly a facade. It's not a trick I'm trying to play on you. I'm not lying to you. It's a bit of a learned mechanism. You see, here's the truth. And those of you who've been with me for a long time know this. I am an incredibly emotional human being, as we all are. There's no such thing as an unemotional human being. But when I was a kid... I was massively emotional. I'm not getting choked up here. Let's have a frog in my throat. I was massively emotional, but I had low emotional intelligence. I had a low EQ, which means I felt deeply, but I didn't understand what I was feeling or what to do with my feelings. And so in this vagueness, there was a war inside of me as these emotions, these feelings would wash over me in waves after waves, and I wouldn't know what to do with this. I told you I was going to speak out of honesty and vulnerability this morning because that's the only way I believe I can preach on this topic that I think that God wants us to share and walk with. I remember being seven years old, and I won't go into all of the details, but uh, there was a family tragedy at the beginning of one week, and at the end of it, there was a murder-suicide in my family. I was seven years old, and out of that, my one cousin was so horribly burnt, we were told almost every week for a year he was going to die. He almost died like 30 times. He was uh, two years younger than me, three years younger than me. He survived, but I didn't know that that was going to happen, right? I'm seven years old. What was worse for me was by the end of the week, I was informed of my dad's cancer diagnosis. He had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Sorry, not Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, And so in the same week, I had an uncle murder someone in my family and kill himself. And my dad got diagnosed with cancer, and my mom sat us down and said, your cousin is almost certainly not going to make it. We think your dad's going to make it, though. Well, that was a hard week, right? And I was an emotional kid with low emotional intelligence. Do you know what happened? I got really angry. You see, I didn't just lose an uncle and a cousin. I lost my dad for a year because he was sick, and I mean sick. And I didn't just lose that. I lost my mom. Why? 
Somebody had to take care of my dad. They ran their own business. You don't get EI. She had to fill in and try to run a business while taking care of my dad. I hardly saw my mom for a year. I was seven, and I was scared, and I was alone. And here's what was worse for me. When I did see my dad, because he was mostly at the hospital, but when I did see my dad, he was either sleeping or uh, he was so sick, he looked like a monster to me. He, becomes, he became scary to me. I remember my dad asking one time if I would hug him, and I cried and ran away. I missed him dearly, but the treatment was so bad, he smelt like burnt flesh. He smelt like cooking meat because the radiation was so strong I could smell it coming off of him. And he was, he was dr- drunk from all of the pain meds and the radiation. And so he'd walk around and stumble and he stank and I didn't know who he was and I ran from him. That's what happened when I was seven. And like anybody who feels deeply but doesn't know how to process their feelings, I got really angry and really sad. And I got into fights and I yelled and I lost my temper and I retreated into my own mind and I cried myself to sleep every night for over a year. Yes, this is Jason, and I'm aware that I I look really highly rational and even keel, but that took me a very long time. I retreated deep into my own mind because I kept lashing out. I remember one time I would have been, what, grade, grade two, grade three, I can't remember. I remember which teacher, though, and I actually really liked her. She was an amazing teacher. We connected a year or two ago. Uh, I remember one morning at school lashing out and physically attacking her, biting and hitting and kicking. And the principal had to drag me out of the school. It was a very stressful time, and I was feeling all of these oppressive emotions, and I didn't have a hot clue what to do with them. And you know what? I think that's a pretty fitting analogy for this day and age. Everything's scary, everything's changed, nothing is constant, you don't know who's in charge, you don't know what's going to happen to you, your rights, freedoms, and responsibilities change day by day, hour by hour, and everybody's emotions are 10 out of 10, and we're all in a crisis state, baseline. And people get angry, and people get sad. Remember last week, I talked about how the two responses we see in culture are fear and belligerent rebellion. We have, we have people who, who receive the narrative that life is scary and short and terrifying, and they respond out of fear. And then we have this other side that gets really upset about all the fear-mongering, and they get really mad. And it seems to be this dichotomous choice between cowering in fear or being belligerent in rebellion. And yet Jesus consistently walked a third way. I unpack that last time, and if you're confused or uncertain what I was talking about, I encourage you to go back and view that video. But what I was light on last week were details. I was very light on what we can do about it, and central to all of that is who we are as emotional beings. Between COVID, elections, job loss, debt, fear, worry, changes, we're all feeling things, we're reacting we're frustrated or we're mad at other groups because they're not frustrated enough or we're reacting to other people's frustration because they're responding poorly. And so we're fearful and reactionary and angry and then we're fearful and reactionary and angry about other people's fear, reactions, and anger. You, you get what I'm saying here? This is a bad cycle. It's a bad cycle. And you and me are not going to think our way out of it. When our emotions get out of control or are uncertain or are overpowering, weird things start to happen. We start looping. We start being stuck in the same problems. We start having the same arguments. We start torpedoing the same kinds of relationships again and again and again. That's how I felt as a kid watching my dad get sick. I learned a lesson through that. A powerful lesson. But the wrong lesson. The lesson I learned... It's a a lesson I think that our society in general has adopted. I think I was just an early adopter of the lesson our society is teaching you right now. Maybe I braced it a little deeper or more thoroughly or earlier, but it's the same lesson you're being taught right now. Emotions are random, unhelpful, and uncontrollable. Life should be lived by reason and logic. That's the lesson I learned as a kid. 
We could solve many of life's problems if we could just all calm down, think it through, and make better, more reasonable, and logical decisions without emotions in the way. Now, that's going to get wrapped up in different language these days. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, we make evidence-based decisions? Politicians seem to love it. It's a new buzzword that's come around the last two, three, four years. I see, uh, and I'm not picking on Justin Trudeau. He just happens to be the prime minister right now. Now you see Justin Trudeau come out and say in his uh, tent of meetings outside his house, well, we're making evidence-based decisions about COVID. As if up until very recently, every decision we've all made was just random. We had no evidence. We would just have decisions come up. We'd pull names out of a hat. Now, now, now we've realized we must make evidence-based decisions. No, what he's saying is over emotion, we want to appeal to logic and reason. And you can disagree with him on his logic and reason, but that's the sneaky thing about logic and reason. And we'll get to that in a minute. Evidence-based decision. The, the, the rising of science and scientists to the point of a pseudo-religion. Where, where if you say, oh, I love so-and-so, I love my wife, I love destiny, and some scientist would, would tell you, oh, you actually only have oxytocin flowing through your body, and it, it, it presents as a love hormone, but it, it also has negative consequences, as, and on and on and on. If there's not a scientific tagline to it, it's not real. Have you, have you noticed this? Scientists have our government's ear more than the people who vote for our government. I'm, I'm just saying. And... and most of you haven't found it odd. We are a culture that worships logic and reason. And yet we are more prone to emotional outbursts than ever. Why is that? Well, same thing I learned as a kid. If you try to step on your emotions, they find their way out. When I got a little older, as a teenager... I moved at least one step towards allowing some emotions, but this is what I would have said as a teenager. Emotions are inevitable, but must be managed. You should always lead with your brain. That's been like a motto for my life. Emotions are inevitable. They need to be managed, but you should always lead with your brain. Sounds really good. That makes me sound so smart, hey? It's not true. It's not helpful. It doesn't work. It's not biblical. It's not how God made me. See, you're not a rational human being. Neither am I. We're made as rational, emotional human beings. You see, we're made in God's image. I believe that, at least. See, God's emotional. God laughs, and he weeps. And he gets angry, and he has hopes for you and for his children, and he loves, and and he gets jealous, and he cares, and he's invested, and he gets disappointed, and, and, and... God is an emotional being. And so if you try to cut yourself off from emotions, you actually make yourself look less like God. And what will happen is all your faculties, including your reasoning, will atrophy as you make yourself look less like God because emotions and your heart is the seat of authority and power in your life. Now your mind, your thoughts, your thinking should be the seat of guidance, sure, absolutely, but your heart's the engine that drives you. I'll unpack some of this throughout this morning. He made us the same way. He made us emotional. He made our feelings a deep part of us, and he called it good. We open ourselves to all sorts of manipulation. See, if you're not in control of your emotion, if you're not aware of them, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how to become more aware, and it might sound a little odd coming from me, but I hope we can go on a good journey this morning. You're actually open to manipulation, fear-mongering. Because... Because if you're not aware of your emotions, you've got no control over your emotions. And if you don't have control over your emotions, someone else does. And whoever has control over your emotions has control over your whole self. Find some young teenager in puppy dog love with some girl. His life is in the palm of her hands. He can think all he wants every day, but she controls him, right? We've all seen this. People rant and rail about the media. They rant and rail about social media, about the news and fake news, or Trump, or Biden, or pick your thing, masks, anti-masks, anti-vaccinations, vaccinations. None of it holds sway over you at all if you are emotionally healthy and understand your whole self. You're free. You're free of it, just like Jesus was free of it. He said, the world has no hold on me. Sin has nothing in me, because he knew precisely who he was. 
Otherwise, we're open to all sorts of manipulations, tensions, inevitably get stuck in a groundhog day sort of repeat of cycles again and again and again. Now, our emotions are powerful, but they aren't necessarily holy. Our emotions are corrupted by sin, just like our thinking is. Proverbs 29, 11, throw that verse up there. It says, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man holds it in check. You're feeling things, but if you give vent to it, you're a fool, says the Bible. If you give unchecked venting to your anger, you're a fool. But Ephesians 4, 26 says this. He says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So what the Bible is saying is, you're going to feel stuff. You'll be angry. And it's okay to be angry, but there's a way to experience your emotions without sinning. There's a way to experience your emotions, to go through your emotions, that actually increases your health and awareness, connection with God and authority. You can't just give full vent in it. We can't trust every emotion, just like you can't trust every thought. And we can't give full vent to every emotion, just like every thought you've ever had at two in the morning wasn't a good thought. Every feeling you've ever felt isn't a good feeling, right? I'm not advocating some like wild, out of control venting of every emotion. See, what most people do is they either give full vent to their emotion, which I saw a lot as a kid and experienced as a kid, or they do what I did as a teenager and they try to block them and shut them down. Both of them leave you slaves to your emotions. You either live by your emotions and die by them, or you try to cut them out, and you're already dead. What we need to do is redeem and reconcile our emotions with our whole self and with God. That's the process I want to walk you through this morning. And obviously, this will be in brief. But I hope to be unpacking this a little bit further throughout the coming weeks as we meet together digitally. Emotions aren't bad, and if you hear nothing else this morning, somebody here needs to hear the fact that you're feeling things, the fact that you're scared or angry or worried or doubtful or whatever else isn't bad. It's okay. God made your emotions. I want you to hear this. Emotions are holy and created by God, but not everything you feel is in right alignment with God. Okay? Romans 12, 2, it's a verse we often quote here. It says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Now, when I was a kid, teenager, young adult, I would have told you, see, look at that. The power here is to be transformed by your mind. And all you emotionally feeling people, I would say, ah, check and mate the mind. Yeah, read the Greek. Mind equals the mind, comprising alike the faculties of perceiving and understanding and those of feeling, judging, and determining. Shoot. Buried right into the center of the renewing of your mind is renewing of your thoughts, perceptions, feelings, and emotions. Because you're not a separate physical, separate emotional, and separate spiritual being. God made all three of them and called them all good. So the renewing of your feelings is as important as the renewing of your mind. So just like bad thoughts get you into trouble, so do bad emotions. Just like no thoughts make you stupid, no emotions make you dead. You need both. You need them both well. So this morning is what we want to walk through. Enough preamble? Have I sold you on it? Let's go. Let's get her done. How do we do this? First step, most important step, can't build if you don't have your first step. It's where I stumbled so much as a kid. You have to know what your emotions are. Now, for some of you, this is going to be easy because there's all of them all the time. Just grab a highlighter and just, they're all in there. For some of you like me, it might be a little bit harder, but you got to know what your emotions are, what they really are. Otherwise, how can you understand them? Or work with them, or heal them, or elevate them. Fan them into flames. Or hand them off to God. How do you know what to do if you don't know what they are? Look, I remember crying myself to sleep almost every night when I was seven. I remember one time crying myself to sleep again, shortly after attacking that teacher. And and, and wondering why I had done that, because I liked the teacher. But I was so sad and angry all the time. It was just so much sad and angry. And I didn't know what to do with it. That would have been a good question. But it it didn't help me. I'll tell you why. It didn't help me because I wasn't actually angry or sad. 
I didn't know what my emotions were. I would have said, why am I so angry and sad all the time? But I wasn't. I was scared. I was a seven-year-old boy. And my dad was dying, I thought. And my mom was gone, taking care of my dad. And I was anxious. And I was worried. And I felt overwhelmed and pressured and helpless. And probably I felt excluded from the decision-making process that was happening around me and even some of the decisions that were happening to me. And these are all natural feelings that make perfect sense in hindsight. But you notice which words were missing from that? Angry and sad. And if I don't know what I'm feeling, I don't know how to move forward. And neither do you. You got to know what you're feeling, first and foremost. That might be hard. It might take you on a little bit of a journey. It might take you time. It's taken me time to get back to a place or even to get to a place where I can identify my emotions because I spent so many years trying to cut them out of me. But because my emotions presented as anger and sadness, I ended up stuck jumping from powerful feelings of rage to an exhausted sorrow in a loop for a long time. And I didn't know what to do about it because I didn't even know what I was feeling. Look, the problem, guys, the problem is that how you think and feel is the problem. Your problem is that how you think and feel is your problem. Last Sunday, I talked about fear and belligerent rebellion as the two big choices. Those are the two big choices because fear and anger are the only thing we talk about. Very, 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 very few people are actually angry. I was talking to a guy not that long ago, and he said, I'm so angry at the government because they took away my rights with all this COVID blank, blank. I'm so angry at the government. It took me about three or four questions to realize the dude's not angry. The guy's looking at his family and his budget. And his jobs being taken away are reduced so severely that he can't support his family. And he's looking at their debt growing. And he's looking at his kids as they're growing. And he's looking at his wife. And he doesn't know how to face his wife and tell him, I think I'm going to get laid off because of COVID. And I'm deeply scared. Looks like anger. It's not angry. It looks like it's about the government. It's not about the government. He's scared because he just wants to provide for his kids. Yeah, but as long as you're angry at the government, you'll never fix the fact that you're afraid. Right? You understand what I'm saying? You got to know what you're feeling. You'll never be able to process or respond to the thing you're stuck in if you don't even know what you're stuck with. If you don't know what you're feeling, you don't know if it's healthy or unhealthy, righteous or unhealthy. Um, there was an old, I'm going to blow through this here a little bit, but there was an old uh, study. They put a bunch of people... Uh, who said they had arachnophobia. They had a fear of spiders. Do you have a fear of spiders? Just imagine the biggest, giantest, most hairiest tarantula right now. Do it. You have to do it. Do it now. Do it. Do it. I didn't put it on the screen, but, I, but just do it now. What it is, they put them in a, in a large, about, about the size of this, actually double stage, plexiglass thing, and they put a giant, hairy tarantula on the one side. It wasn't venomous, but they put it there. And they put the other people on the other side, and they said, go as close as you think you can, and then, and then you can stop. If you can touch it, please touch it. So then they measured how close the people were. Then afterwards, they divided up into several groups. And one group studied things that had nothing to do with spiders, just to fill time. That was the control group. One group, they actually studied facts about that spider and how it's not venomous and how easy it is to recover from spider bites and how rare spider bites happen and all of these things. And they learned true facts about that spider. The third group learned techniques for managing arachnophobia. You know what the fourth group did? They said, list in as much detail as you can how you felt when you were close to that spider. The next week, they ran the same experiment. The three first groups, the ones who did nothing, the ones who studied facts, uh, and the ones who talked about uh, methods for getting over arachnophobia, tested on average exactly the same. The group that did nothing but list their emotions all made headway. They were less scared because they admitted they were scared. You see, they addressed the real emotion. 
And suddenly the natural health and ability of our bodies and our minds and our spirit to begin repairing us and bringing us out began to work in them. God started working before they even knew there was something to work on. Guys, what are you feeling? Me? I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Oh, that sure wants to rise up anxiousness in me and worry. I, I don't know what you guys always need. And being online, I feel distant sometimes. It's hard to reach out. And it makes me feel isolated. I didn't like that. I'm a social guy. Until we admit that, we're dead in the water. Do I throw up that feelings wheel? Oh, it's there already. Look at that. Thank you. You know, maybe this isn't helpful to you. And maybe this makes you feel like a kid. I don't care. I turned 36 yesterday. I use this every week. What is this? It's a feelings wheel. So when I say, oh, I feel angry, what do I actually feel? Well, I'm feeling, maybe I'm feeling distant. Why? Well, maybe because I'm feeling numb. There, look, I'm getting to something more specific. I'm feeling anxious and knotted up. Maybe when I was seven years old, I, I felt like I had a loss of control. I felt like, I don't know, I don't know where you're at. But I find this a useful tool, and I put it up as a slide. You can just type in feelings wheel if you want to in Google, or you can look online and you can watch this video. It's in there now. Find your own thing. I don't care. Maybe this doesn't work for you. I'm a nice, logical, rational guy, so following a little trail on a, on a wheel sure helps me. At the end of the day, I, you need to know what you're feeling, because how you think and feel about the problem is the problem. So great. Now we're beginning to renew our mind, which means our perceptions, our thoughts, and our feelings. What's next? Sorry, I got my notes here mixed up. Well, secondly, you're going to have to know why you're feeling what you're feeling. See, going back to my childhood, I had a major second layer to this problem. I barely knew what I was feeling, and most of the time I didn't know what I was feeling, but then I made the same mistake that everybody makes in culture today. You've made recently, I promise you. Go look on your social media accounts, scroll back within the last month on Facebook, you've made this mistake. This is our biggest mistake our culture makes. We have all these feelings, and we don't know why they're there, so you make a rational seeming assumption that the person, event, or experience right now in the moment that's flaring your feelings up is the cause. I yelled at the gas station attendant because he ticked me off. No, you yelled at him because your boss belittled you all day and you felt insignificant and you finally felt the place where you could assert your authority and he did one little thing wrong and you lost it on him. It's got nothing to do with the gas attendant. If you don't know why you're feeling what you're feeling, you don't know what to do with it yet. It's called the lightning rod principle. You just react to whatever pushes you over the edge rather than address why you're at the edge in the first place. This is a time of heightened energy and nervousness and anger and frustration and fear. And we're reacting at whatever happens to be either easy or safe to react to. That's where social media is kind of the worst demon around sometimes because it makes your reactions safer and easier. I can yell at you from the comfort of my own home and I don't have to face you you wouldn't say half the things you say on social media to the person's face. It allows us to give into the lightning rod principle. So why did I get mad at that teacher? Why did I attack that teacher? I actually liked that teacher. Well, because I was scared and felt out of control on the rest of my life, and I was at or beyond my limit, and I felt like I had no agency in my life, and then all the teacher had to do was maybe say to me one little thing that limited me, maybe just something as simple as Jason, be quiet, or Jason, sit down, which I heard several times an hour for my whole life. Jason, be quiet. Jason, sit down. And I felt like it was the last straw, like my last right was being taken away or whatever the deal was, and I reacted at the teacher. But it had nothing to do with the teacher. It had to do with half a year watching my dad die in front of me. But I didn't know that. Luckily, the teacher was emotionally intelligent and didn't take it personally. You got to know what you're feeling, and you got to know why you're feeling it. I had a great talk with somebody earlier this week who said, this is what I'm feeling, this is why I'm feeling it. Can we talk about it? 
And I said, this is my absolute favorite conversation because you've done all the work necessary. Now we can have an honest conversation. And it was fantastic. One of my favorite conversations this week because the work had been done. We knew what we were talking about and why we were talking about it. There's so many places I can go here, but we're just going to move on for a bit here. My inner voice is telling me to censor myself. In Mark 8, 31 to 33, Peter experienced this whole problem. Here's what happened. It says, then, then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and arise after three days. Jesus was telling them the game plan. And he was talking about it openly. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. saying, Jesus, no, we don't need to talk about this right now. But turning around and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but man's. <clears throat> you see, Peter will have had a million rational explanations for why what he's saying was wise, smart, good, whatever. But what Jesus could see through the spirit was that Peter's feelings were unknown and his reasons were unknown and he was acting out or he was reacting out of a fear. See, if Peter could have said to Jesus, Jesus, I'm afraid of what that means because I don't want to lose my life as well, then Jesus could address it. But acting out of an unknown fear, a hidden fear, misplaced and misassigned by Peter, he became a stumbling block to Jesus and Jesus had to remove him. How many of us are in that same boat? Because we don't know what we're feeling or we don't know why we're feeling it. We're trapped reacting in our fear and we end up disqualifying ourselves from what God's doing right now. We're in code red right now. People are stressed. People need hope and love and care. Don't disqualify yourself. That's why when I was talking last week, I said, we're going to follow all the rules. You're going to mask when you come in. You're going to mask when you're not seated. We're going to not violate the rules. We're going to social distance and all these things. Some people came to me and said, are you caving into the government? And I'm saying, mm, sort of, no, no, I don't want this or my feelings about this to get in the way of advancing God's kingdom. So I have to know what I'm feeling and why I'm actually feeling it. Process through. And then we'll talk about the third step in a second. See, because the problem is that how you think and feel about the problem is the problem. So everything I said right now, up till this point in time, all jives with modern pop psychology. We're almost done. Just bear with me. I, just, I really want to get through this. I felt this, this was a, a, a whole capsule this morning I wanted to, to, to finish. Pop psychology would agree with me on everything I said. But now we're going to differ. We're going to embark on a bit of a different road. Because pop psychology puts it back in your hands. There's a book to read or a method to follow or a breathing technique or a something. But if the problem is that how you think and feel is the problem, how are you going to get yourself out of your own problem? And if my problem is how I think and feel is my problem, then how can you trust me to help you get over your problem about how you think and feel about the problem? You understand? How can we help each other if we are the problem? I might have a piece, and you might have a piece, and you might have a piece, but the problem is that we can't think purely rationally, and we can't think in healthy emotions only in and of ourselves, so how do we even know how to combine it? Well, we don't. We don't. And the culture, our world, is stuck. And even as pop psychology, and even as uh, psychoanalysis, and all of these things advance and advance and advance, we seem to get to a place where the world is filled with more fear and reaction and anger. And it seems like we're going downhill with our emotional health as we make emotional health a bigger and bigger deal. This was predicted. Second Peter 3, verse 3, the Bible talks about this. It says, but above all, remember that in the last days, just so you know, this isn't an end time sermon, but we are in the ending times, whatever that means. We're, we're in the last-ish days. It says, above all, remember that in the last days, men will come who make a mock at everything. Well, that sounds like now. I know a couple of mocking people. Men governed only by their own passions, by how they feel. Feel in the moment. That's what a passion is. In the last days, men, mockers, will come who are governed by their feelings. And it does not matter how much pop psychology you read. It was written by people governed by their feelings. 
and it'll leave you governed by your feelings. Remember, whoever controls your feelings controls your whole self. So, how do we get out of this? Are we stuck now? That's it? We're just a bunch of broken people going to do some broken things together? Well, there's actually a, a way. There's a way out of this. We need to align our actions with a healthy template. What? And no, that healthy template isn't Freud or Carl Jung or pick your favorite person. It's not Joyce Myers or Whoopi Goldberg or whatever else is your your great beacon of light. Because they're broken people too. It's not Rick Warren. It's not Andy Stanley. It's not Craig Grishel. Because they're also broken people. And their problem is that how they think and feel is their problem. There's only one template. You see, God spoke. If you're not a believer right now this morning, I hope you got something out of it. Best of luck. Maybe a little boost in your day. Maybe I'll see you next week. But but I actually believe there is a template. I believe there is something you can rest yourself on. Your thoughts and emotions, all of who you are. Your physical being and your whole self. And I believe that's the absolute word of God that never changes, moves, budges, or shifts. And it's true to every letter and punctuation point. We actually have a template. You see, it doesn't help you if you don't know what you're feeling or why you're feeling it. Because the Bible says a whole lot of things about a whole lot of stuff. But if you know what you're feeling and why you're feeling it, then you can know what to do with that. You can know if it's a holy or unholy, righteous or unrighteous feeling. You can begin to parse through your motivations. You, be, you can begin to integrate how you're feeling with how you're thinking to become a whole person. And when you are, you become unmanipulatable. You become uncontrollable. You become dangerous. You become a lion in the kingdom of God when you begin to become a whole self. When your emotions and your mind are unified behind the will and person of God, you become dangerous to the kingdom of this world because it has no hold on you and it can't control you. And when circumstances come and go and masks come and go and code red comes and goes, you can stand firm. Back in the Old Testament, in the days of Acts, there were women, meek, young, 90-pound women who smiled and laughed and prayed raised Jesus in the lion's den as they were shredded in the pantheon. How did they do that? They knew who they were in Christ and they were dangerous. And we live on the template and the memory of sacrifice such as that. And we quake and fear at a piece of fabric. Oh, us of little faith. It's because we have been given over to our passions. Said the guy who just lost himself in the passion of the moment. But anyway, Do what I say, not what I do. What's the template? Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. Do you read your Bible? There will be an inverse proportion to how emotionally healthy you are and how much you actually dwell in the scriptures of God. I know I sound like a pastor here, but I I actually believe this because I've lived this. Because I've spent the last 15 years challenged by God on a journey of emotional health. And no, I am not nearly done. But I'm not the man I once was. I'm not the man I once was. And I know why. I know why. Because I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind to my emotions, but now I'm beginning to see as God's opened it up. God spoke King David over me one time years ago. I dove into that a little bit. Couldn't get a much more emotional guy to King David. He made mistakes in his emotions. He also has greatest victories out of his emotions. So I took a cue from that and decided that, you know what, maybe my emotions weren't evil. What does the Bible say? Philippians 3, verses 6 to 7 says, don't worry. Anxiousness, fear, right? Right now, guys, don't worry. Don't worry about anything. What are we doing next week? How do we meet needs? What if there's a funeral? I don't know, guys, don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought. That's one of those tricky verses. This is the same thought for the same mind we just had. Remember the definition of that? The mind comprising alike the faculties of perceiving and understanding and those of feeling, judging, and determining. And the peace of God which surpasses every feeling will guard your hearts and minds. He's even telling you. 
In case you missed it in the thought translation, he's telling you your heart and mind. So you tell God your thoughts, which is what you're feeling, as well as what you're thinking, but you tell God your thoughts, and he guards both your heart and mind, both the seed of your emotions and the seed of your thoughts. He guards you. He leads you into health and unity within yourself and with him. Amen? Is this good news? It is to me. Because, oh, goodness, do I need help guarding my heart and my mind right now. But what is the condition of being released to be the guarded by God himself, that Jesus Christ himself would be with you and guard your feelings and your thoughts? The condition is that you make it known to him. What's the implied condition? That you know. That you know what you're feeling. You know why you're feeling it. Bring it to him. He'll guide you through it. Now, I don't know, and this is not Bible now. This is my own personal experience, but I I think it's generalizable enough. I'll share it with you this morning. Um, I have found that the Holy Spirit is particularly unhelpful with your own feelings if you're dishonest about your feelings. He's let me wander around in very long, very deep wastelands before. Not because he doesn't care about me, but because he precisely cares about me. But I have found that the moment I'm able to honestly assess and address my own emotions and the own reasons behind them, he's there for me. He's there for me. He's waiting. But if I don't know what I'm talking about, and if he just fixes everything, I'm just as lost tomorrow as I was today. So he guides me through it. And sometimes that's a long journey, guys. Some of you are in pain. And you've been in pain for a long time. You've been in pain for a long time. You think it's because God doesn't care about you. But it's actually because he cares so much about you. He wants to walk you through a place of healing, of deeper healing. Not just removing the circumstances around them, but actually leading you through them. I think this COVID time, I think I said this last week, I think in 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to look back on this as a church and we're going to say we wouldn't trade it for the world. Because it made us face our own demons made us face our own brokenness, brings us humbly before the throne room of God. It checks our arrogance, makes us hungry, helps us seek him, helps us identify with the hurting and the lost. I can't wait. Literally, I can't wait because I don't want to be here because it sucks. But long term, if this can lead us into a place of better health, emotional awareness, I wouldn't trade for the world. I wouldn't trade it in the world. I'm going to lead you, lead you, leave you with one last verse. I know we've gone a little over time here, but I just really felt like I want to just, just finish this off, tie this down with a little bow, and we'll dive into some of this deeper in the, in the coming weeks if you guys want to walk with me on that. Maybe I'll get somebody who actually understands emotions better to talk on emotions. That might be good too. 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 to 7. Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power and love and sound judgment. Sound judgment is of the mind. Love is of the heart. And power is what the two of them look like together. You have power if you have a sound mind and love. I don't care how smart you are. If you're not speaking out of love, you're speaking sin. Did you hear that? I don't care how right you are. If your Facebook comment is not made in love, then it's sin. Because power, righteous power, only comes from righteous love and a sound mind. Are you hearing me? You're going to be tested sorely in fear, doubt, worry, and anger in the coming weeks, as will I. Let's hold each other accountable in a good way. Let's encourage each other, build each other up, all right? Because we're all in this together, amen? Amen. All right, so last week I gave you a challenge, right? I said, reach out to one person who you would not normally reach out to. Just touch base with them. It can be as simple as a little text, hey, how you doing? A little phone call, whatever it looks like. Okay, I got my second challenge for this all. That same person. Okay, if you didn't reach out to somebody, come on, what are you doing? We've got to reach out to people. But if you didn't reach out to that person, reach out to them this week. But here's step two. Ask them 
what can I pray for you about? And when they tell you, because almost everybody will tell you, I don't care if they're unbelievers or not, they're going to, oh, you know, I'm really stressed or whatever. People love to be prayed for. Like 99.9% of all people love to be prayed for. Okay. So when they tell you your prayer request, here's what you do. Ask them, how are you feeling about it? And pray for that. I'm worried because I might lose my job. There's your prayer request, right? The job thing, it'll come and go. The worry, that's the rot in the soul. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just trying to coach you guys through this stuff. So reach out to somebody, okay? Now this person, if you want it to be, this can be a close friend or a family member, all right? You don't have to reach out to a brand new stranger to do this, but reach out to somebody this week. Ask them for a prayer request and ask them what they're feeling. Can you guys do that? Raise your hand now if you want to commit to doing that. I'm going to do it. You don't have to. This is my challenge. Let me know how it goes. Email me. No names. You don't have to give me names, situations, or data or anything like that. Shoot me a text or an email. Let me know how that went. Okay? I think this is so powerful. Now, there's a lot this morning. I'm going to close. I'm going to invite the band to come on up. I just want to pray this over with you. Now, if you'd like to receive a prayer about this, I'm just going to ask you just on your knees, just put your hands open on your knees, palm up, right? Like you're receiving. Um, And I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to pray God's blessing. Lord God, everybody gathered here right now who wishes to receive a blessing, I just want to bless them. You've led us. You've guided us. You've cared for us. You've made us both thinking and feeling people. Lord God, we repent for when we've given full vent to our emotions. But we also repent for where we've cut them out. God, I just pray you'd guide us through this. Make us healthy. Make us whole. Guide us in resilience. And most of all, Lord God, that you guide us in love. We wouldn't be given to our passions, Lord God. But we'd be healthy managers of the varied grace of God. I pray a special blessing for each man, woman, and child right now who is going to go out this week and actually try to pray for someone else. I pray you'd release them, you'd guide them, and you'd care for them. We say all these things in your precious name, and everybody said...